Well, hello everyone and welcome to the alumni panel. Um, it's great to have you with us today. My name um, is Ken Diffenderfer. Um, I'm a Bridges alumni from the class of 2010 to 2011 um, from Cal State Channel Islands. Um, um, after uh, my Bridges uh, program ended, I joined um, the Stem Cell Corps at the Salk Institute and have been um, in and around the Stem Cell Corps um, at Salk since and now um, serve as the director of, of the Corps. Uh, we'll have the other panelists quickly introduce themselves and then we'll get into um, the discussion. Um, we have the Q&A uh, window open, so please drop your questions in there um, if you do have them. Um, and we would uh, be happy to address those and discuss those um, items and topics. Um, if not, we um, will just kind of um, have some general discussion amongst the panelists here too as well. Okay, right, um, next um, we'll have um, Ankit introduce himself. Hey everyone, my name is Ankit. Um, I went to Cal State Fullerton University, graduated in 2018. Um, I'm part of the CERM intern class of 2016 to 2017. Did my internship at Stanford in Dr. Michael Lanker's lab, uh, where I focused on doing research and skeletal stem cell biology. Um, after my internship, I was hired on as a lab technician, worked there for two years, and now I'll be starting my MD PhD studies at University of California at San Francisco. Nice to meet you all. Looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, Ankit. And then we'll kick it over to Carl. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, my name is Carl Dargetz, and I'm from a program through Cal Poly San Luis Obispo 2013. Um, I did my internship at the Salk Institute uh, in Dr. Inder Verma's lab, and there I was studying, um, doing some differentiation of iPSCs into lung airway epithelium and um, looking at uh, characterizing those um, as well as um, you know, some other uh, additional differentiation uh, work into some other lineages. That was the main focus. And then during that time, I did a lot of work at the stem cell core, of course, and um, met Ken there and um, was able to um, get a job at the stem cell core and, and work with him um, for a couple of years after my internship, um, at which time I moved over to Thermo Fisher Scientific um, based in Carlsbad here in North County, San Diego, where I am now. I've been here for about five years, and now um, I manage a small team um, working in the cell and gene therapy space uh, that works on instrumentation for cell processing. So I'm um, looking forward to discussing with everyone, and um, yeah, I think we can keep this kind of informal and really looking forward to seeing you know, what kind of things uh, you're wondering about. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. And last but certainly not least, Sarah. Thanks, Ken. Uh, my name is Sarah Fernandez. I did my bachelor's degree at the University of California, San Diego. Um, I got a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and cell biology. And then I moved on to San Diego State University where I did my master's degree in cell and molecular biology. And um, during that time in 2017, I joined the CERN internship program. Um, and I did my internship at the Salk Institute in the laboratory of Dr. Uh, Fred Gage. He has a neurobiology lab here, so we study both um, the healthy, healthy and diseased brain states. Um, and I'm happy to meet you all today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Sarah, would you quickly add uh, kind of the uh, research topic that you've been engaged in? Oh, yes, sir. Because sir. I think um, it's relevant, important, and interesting. Yeah, okay. I, I work with brain organoids. I do a lot of uh, disease modeling and I'm really passionate about making brain organoids, um, developing these physiologically relevant model systems to study diseases. Um, right now we have a project with Alzheimer's disease that I'm really excited about. Um, and we also do some uh, evolutionary biology. So we look at human brain organoids and compare those to non-human primates and look at human specific processes of development. Because um, one thing that brain organoids are really good at doing is recapitulating some early processes of brain development. Awesome, thank you. All right, so um, no questions have trickled in yet. Please do um, um, funnel those in if, you, um, if the audience has any, and we would be very happy to address those. Um, while we're waiting on them, I will just start um, with a few um, questions we identified as a group here. Um, and I think Sarah, um, we'll, we'll start with you with this one. Um, um, uh, so how did your Bridges experience um, ultimately prepare you um, for your kind of graduate um, education career? Yeah, there is um, so many different um, activities and things I think that we did during the Bridges experience. 
that um, kind of prepared me for graduate school. So presenting my research at conferences, major conferences like ISSCR and the opportunity to speak and share my research really kind of prepped me for these um, kinds of presentations. And just the, the lab experience you get and the access to the labs um, really helped me develop my technical skills and gain new skills in regenerative medicine and, and tissue culture that were really invaluable. Um, yeah, the opportunity to work with just the, the amazing scientists and things that we get to work with, I think is um, really an invaluable experience. Yeah, awesome. Um, Ankit, how about you? What did you find to be um, kind of the most um, valuable, impactful um, element of the Bridges program in regards to your, you know, um, upcoming graduate endeavors? Yeah, for me personally, I was on the fence whether I wanted to do uh, MD or MD PhD. Uh, so the Bridges program really exposed me to the transitional aspects of medicine, um, coexisting in the clinic and also the research side. Um, it really allowed me to work at on transitional uh, problems that occur in the clinic and bring them back to the bench stop and uh, honestly address them. They really gave me an exposure to how difficult it is to go back and forth between the two uh, disciplines. Um, but just piggyback off of uh, what Sarah was saying also, I think the most important thing for me personally was giving me the confidence to really uh, read, present, and talk about my research at conferences. Uh, just design experiments from the ground up and then troubleshoot them, writing manuscripts. And I was able to just gain a, a handful of skill sets I would have not gained otherwise. And for me personally, uh, it helped me prepare for my interviews. Um, during my MD PhD interviews, I was able to talk about my research at a, at a high level and uh, just t discuss with other scientists about other research problems that are occurring in, Europe, in the clinic. Yeah. Um, Ankit, I'm curious, um, so if we think about that kind of bench to bedside transition that the MD PhD program you'd be going into would allow, you know, obviously a bunch of bench, you know, through the internship and other activities. Um, did you feel like you had engagement on the bedside through other outreach and engagement, patient engagement activities um, that the program offered? Um, what was your, what was your take on that? Yes, um, I was for the last cohort that um, was focusing on mouse skeletal stem or mouse stem cells, and I know I switched over to human stem cells um, afterwards. So um, at Stanford, I was able to actually go to work on the human um, aspect and go to the hospital as well and shadow physicians that I was working with. And I think that the CIRM obviously opened the door for that, allowed me to work in a lab that focused on transitional med medicine. And that was one of my also uh, curiosities I had is how to bridge that gap early on. So I specifically chose a lab that was run by MD that had access to the clinic and also was focusing on human um, patient populations in, in the, the lab laboratory as well. So yeah. uh, that really allowed me to really you know, gain a whole breadth of experience that I would have not gained otherwise if it wasn't for the CERN program. Yeah, that's a um, great insight. Um, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Hey, uh, Carl, how about you? What was the most impactful um, element of your Bridges career as you consider how that um, helped you um, to get into thermo and manage the team you're managing now? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll echo some of the sentiments that the other panelists mentioned around, you know, technical ability and just kind of learning what it takes to be a scientist, you know, on the bench. But I'll also add to that that I think, you know, for, for me and for a lot of the interns that I've interacted with, you know, this is the first experience you have to operate in a professional scientific environment. And so as much as those technical skills are extremely important, Ultimately, if, if you're going to be a successful, no matter where your focus is, if that's academia, if that's industry, you know, you need to know how to work with other people effectively. You need to know how to communicate effectively, both technically and just, you know, in, in terms of planning, logistics, you know, getting along with other people in the workplace. So I think there's a lot of soft skills that are probably underrated, you know, about that internship experience that, that really do have a huge impact. And, you know, I still think back to a lot of the, you know, experience I've had during that internship that have, you know, helped me kind of navigate different situations that I've come across since then. So I think there's a, there's a lot of um, sort of unforeseen benefits to, you know, undergoing that internship and undergoing the, the program as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that emphasis on the soft skills, Carl. I feel like oftentimes, um, you know, um, if I think back to where I was at when I was going through the Bridges programs, it was really about what kind of technicality can I you know, soak up and what can I become expert in, you know, 
with procedures and techniques and um, a lot, a lot that you gain from programs like this is absolutely the softer skills and how to, you know, interact and work with large and diverse groups of people, you know, across, you know, um, you know, and organizational levels from peers to postdocs to PIs, you know, um, and everything else in between. Um, um, really, really love that thought there. So yeah, um, a lot of good questions trickling in here. So we'll tackle a few of these. Um, Ankit, one came in specifically for you um, and asking, um, was your internship at Stanford with CERN Bridges? And if so, how did you land that internship? So I guess general question on, you know, kind of how you um, chose to be at Stanford and, um, um, uh, you know, uh, what kind of access, um, general access to the faculty there um, or internship opportunities um, would be there? Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to, uh, like I mentioned before, really work on the transitional aspect of research. So I wanted to go to Stanford from the get go. Um, I was kind of just set on going there because I felt like it would give me the opportunity to perform high caliber stem cell research and also give me access to patient populations and bring these uh, cells back to the lab and understand them at disease level and also um, just under on injured states. Uh, so just going into this uh, internship, I was looking at a lab specifically at Stanford that had an area of a human component to, to their research as well. And getting in contact with them um, at Fullerton, basically, we, I sent out a cover letter to the faculty members that, were, that had prior CIRM students, um, not particularly from Cal State Fullerton, but just had a record of having CIRM interns. Um, even a few that did not have um, CERM interns, um, I just cold emailed them and a few of them got back to me. And from there, I initiated the process with trying to set up an interview and wondering if they had a uh, position their lab available for me. And at Stanford specifically, um, it might differ from lab to lab because um, I know some of the rules are pretty strict on whether you get access to the OR um, or not, but depending on, I, I was able to basically get access after I was as an as a employee. Um, during my internship, um, I was more so just tied down to the bench, and then that started, those roles also expand as I was an uh, employee of Stanford. Um, so I think uh, that that kind of helped out a lot, being being around Stanford, being in that lab, and having an opportunity open up for me to be a lab technician. Yeah, awesome, cool. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so um, moving on, we have a lot of great questions here, and we'll try to get through most of these guys. Um, okay, so um, next one up um, from Uta. Um, what was the most important aspect of the Bridges program that attracted you to the program in the first place? I will start with that and without any hesitation say that it was funded. Um, um, I think that was a major attractor for me. Um, after that, you know, just the ability to engage, um, you know, with kind of you know, cutting edge labs, really big names, um, um, doing cutting edge science in the stem cell regenerative medicine space. That was um, just unbelievable that you could even work with these people, um, you know, um, and then get paid to do it. Like, you know, what an amazing opportunity. Um, so that was me. Sarah, how about you? What attracted you um, to the program um, in the first place? Yeah, definitely second what you said. I think um, funding is, is really, um, you know, it's a, it gives you the opportunity to do this kind of work and, and not have to worry about um, other financial challenges, which I think is great because it just gives you that focus um, that you need to really kind of develop your skills and things. Um, but yeah, I think for me too, it was definitely uh, the projects that were available. I was really, I, I actually had done a few years in industry before I joined the CERN program and I'd been working with um, stem cells and I really liked this kind of translational aspect of the work. So um, the fact that there was these projects that were uh, available that were disease modeling using stem cells and, and um, just the cutting edge technology uh, really kind of drew me to the program. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Carl, did you have a take on that? What, what drew you to um, the Bridges program um, initially? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh you know, the hands-on aspect, you know, similar to what, what everyone else, you, you and uh, Sarah were saying as well, but just for me personally, you know, out of undergrad, I think I had a lot of good skills and a lot of, um, you know, good understanding of things, but I didn't quite feel ready to put that into practice, you know, in a, a real, you know, workplace. And so that internship, 
you know, I viewed that as kind of my, my way to, to test drive that as a career, but also to gain those, those skills that would really translate into a, you know, a full-time position and allow me to, to feel like I was ready to, to kind of join the workforce and, and leave school. Cause like I said, to be honest, after undergrad, I, I didn't feel like I was at that place and coming out of the program, I, I really did. I, you know, I felt very prepared and very ready. And so um, it definitely delivered what I was hoping it would, but that was a major draw for me um, outside of some of the things that you both mentioned as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Ankit, did you have anything to add to that? What drew you to the program in the first place? Yeah, I would say one thing also, I think for me personally, it was the aspect of having a protecting environment to make mistakes and learn um, without any repercussions. Everything was a positive. It was just the amount of, you know, effort that you put in and what really drew me initially was like stem cell um, research aspect, regenerative medicine, just seeing how uh, we could use these therapies to help address patient populations. And and that was my overall goal too. I wasn't too sure if I wanted to do the MD or MD PhD or even the PhD. So having an environment that really encourages to grow, um, mature, and also add all the skill sets, as everyone mentioned on this panel, was a very uh, attractive factor for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really like that idea that you kind of didn't, um, you know, have a solid idea on life post CERM when you got into it, right? And this is a great opportunity to figure that out, right? Um, I think that can be a powerful lesson um, through internships. Um, you know, worst case scenario, you realize it's not, you know, what you love, right? Um, and mm -hmm. You still meet a lot of interesting people and do a lot of interesting things. Um, cool. All right, um, we have a really great question here that I love to think about. Um, um, this one's from an anonymous uh, attendee here. Um, and it's, um, what kind of experience did you start the internship with any? Um, were you brand new to a lab? Did you have experience from the get-go? Um, Ankit, maybe we'll start with you um, on that one as well. Um, what, what kind of experience did you start with um, um, going in? Yeah, sure. Um... Before going into the CERM internship, I actually had a couple of years of research in Dr. Neelit Patel's lab at Cal Fullerton. Um, it was more of just drug discovery lab. We were collaborating with the biochemistry lab on campus and creating some skills and testing them across the cell lines. Um, it was a really good um, introduction to what research was, helped me build a foundation and get, gain a lot of skill sets that I wouldn't have, wouldn't have otherwise. Um, but not to say, I know a lot of my cohort uh, members came into this program without any research experience and they're doing great things as well. And the program is specifically set for individuals that have little to none research experience. Um, I was just um, able, you know, I was given an opportunity as an undergrad to do research and then decided to uh, participate in that. Um, Sarah, how about you? What kind of research experience did you come in with originally? I guess you already mentioned that you had a short career in industry beforehand, so I guess some. Yeah, yeah, I had some, um, but I really I kind of got the sense that the program was set up for people at all kind of entry levels too. Like there was people in my cohort who, who didn't have a lot of experience, but um, if you are coming in with some experience too, I think that um, you can develop or grow those skills. Um, um, still, it's, it's not, um, it's kind of, I think you said this before, Ken, it's kind of what you make of the program in a way. So. You can you can really push yourself and build on things and um, yeah, yeah. It has flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. I, re I really like that thought, Sarah. Um, yeah, and it's absolutely what you what you put into it is what you get out of it. And if you put in the effort and you have the drive, um, you you get that much more out of it. Um, um, I um, wanted to add just a little bit of insight here too. So I, uh, having been at SOC for you know a better part of a decade. We have worked with several cohorts of CERM students pretty much every year. We have students in and around the Institute working in and around the core, and they have come in with all manner of experience um, prior to their experience. So people like Sarah and Carl, who've had, you know, um, decent, you know, hands-on experience going in, um, or, you know, um, community college students that, you know, have had effectively some coursework and really not a lot of um, bench experience at all. Um, and I, I think the only thing that is predictive of success um, is actually um, what I mentioned earlier, kind of drive engagement and interest, right? Um, and not necessarily kind of, you know, previous history with doing, you know, research, right? Um, and so if you, if you are in the audience and you are coming into a program with, um, you know, maybe not as much experience as you think you should have or could have or would have, 
that's why you're in the internship, right? That's why you're here, um, is to gain that experience um, and take that opportunity to do it. Um, and that, that um, is a big lesson there. Um, okay, uh, so we have two overlapping questions that I think we'll tackle all at once here. And um, Carl, we'll kick this one to you. Um, what was um, the biggest challenge or most challenging aspect of your Bridges experience? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, that sort of transition from maybe to speak metaphorically, walking to running sort of in terms of your own scientific ability. So when you start out, I think, at least for me, I was very, I, I'd ask my mentor kind of every little thing that would come up, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd want to make sure I was doing it the way that she thought was best and that, you know, I wasn't missing anything. And then, you know, eventually it comes to a point where you can't, you can't be doing that. They don't have time to answer every question. And also, you know, you need, you need to learn. So I think going from the point where I was really overly concerned about checking every little thing and to the point where I was confident enough to make some decisions on my own and start working more and more autonomously was, was the biggest challenge because like I said, you know, I think for a lot of folks that, that transition from, you know, school to the workplace, which, you know, really is what the internship is, is, is a challenging one because there's a lot more um, ambiguity. There's a lot more things that aren't as, as clear, um, you know, what, what you're supposed to be doing and a lot more things that you have to make the decision for yourself on. So that was just a, a challenge and kind of mindset and, um, you know, how, how you come at different types of problems. So that, that was a, probably the biggest thing for me. I mean, and then of course, plenty, tons of mistakes that I made that, you know, were challenging to figure out how to deal with. I think that's something I can tell you right now, you're going to make a big mistake and it's going to be okay. You know, I, I did it and everyone uh, on this panel, I can guarantee has done it too. And it's not about not making the mistake. It's about learning from it, figuring out how to prevent it next time. And it's about how you handle it, you know, in that moment, do you just drop everything and, you know, throw it all away and give up? Or do you, you know, stop, take a deep breath and figure out how you're going to, you know, salvage what you have. Yeah, absolutely. And that'll happen on Friday after nine o'clock in the evening. <laughs> realize exactly how much money you, you, you've lost and wasted and it'll keep you up all night. <laughs> yeah, um, we have all had that experience for sure and still have them probably. Um, yeah. Um, Carl, I wanted to highlight one thing you said, which resonated a lot with me, and that's kind of the jump to kind of enabling independence, right? And so like at some point you have to kind of kind of have that self-realization that, you know, you know what, I have some expertise in this now, right? Um, maybe I haven't been doing this my entire life, but I'm confident and capable. I can think about this, I can problem solve and you know, what, what's the next step there for me to kind of have some independence and drive this project, you know, um, you know, forward without engaging my mentor or postdoc, you know, um, every minute of every day, right? Um, and that's a really critical jump to make and a really hard one to do. Um, 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 and stepping back and realizing that you know something, right? And you have knowledge that can be applied. Um, um, yeah, I really, really love that point. Um, and I think too, just to touch on that really quick one more time uh, yeah. before we drop that point is that those two things are tied together. The fear of making mistakes, I think is very much tied into that lack of independence because you're kind of, it can be tough to, to admit or, or allow for yourself to make those mistakes. But once you do a few times, I think you'll realize that they're not the end of the world and that you can handle them. And then that allows for you to kind of accept that autonomy for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Ankit, how about you? What was the most challenging aspect of your of your CERN program that you that you encountered? Yeah, to elaborate on Carl, I would say also like trusting myself, uh, giving myself the confidence to go in, you know, make I guess perform experiments that cost a lot of money, make mistakes. I think that's the biggest transition for myself too. I think a lot of people kind of that's the biggest challenge that they they face in that transition is just being more independent um, and basically designing your own experiments, carrying out them, troubleshooting, and figuring out what's wrong. Sometimes it could be uh, extremely challenging. It could be frustrating as well. And just getting to the speed of how science is conducted, um, I guess, at my Cal State Fulton University, how it's going to be at Stanford. Um, that was a big kind of, uh, I would say, like a wake-up call, getting thrown in the deep end. Um, there's expectations that you have to meet now. Uh, that I didn't have to while I was an intern at Fullerton versus Stanford. Um, and just understanding that this is, like you mentioned, it's all about effort. 
comes down to is you get what you um, put in. And so uh, that little, you know, month or two of learning protocols, learning how the system system works at Stanford was it was quite challenging. But um, I didn't, you know, as Carl mentioned, everyone goes through it. And once you come out the other side, you're a lot more confident in the ability to conduct science at a high level. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I love what you mentioned about the speed and pace of things. Um, the second I saw the question um, in the QA board here, that's the first thing I thought about is dang, things move fast. And it is really hard to get used to that at the beginning. And kind of the second you finish a big assay, a big project, you know, a big whatever, you know, like, you're on to the next thing and you've already been planning that right and if you haven't been planning that you've been missing an opportunity to move on to the next thing right it's um it goes quick it goes quick 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 um, and getting used to that pace and staying engaged and active at that level um is is um can be a rude awakening um but a, mm -hmm. a nice one when you get there um to that get through that trial by fire there hey sarah how about you what, what was the biggest um challenge you experienced um, yeah, I agree. I think the the fast pace of um, working in a lab is challenging, can be challenging. Um, something else that's probably an ongoing challenge for me too is, um, I guess I would say like time management. Um, I just want to be involved in everything. So it's hard for me to kind of pick and choose projects and things that I want to work on because everything is exciting and interesting to me. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's, not maybe specific to the program, but it's something that that I kind of continue to be challenged by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, so um, I, a really great question here that I just saw um, regarding how internship experience um, is viewed um, in regard to other experience. I think this question is specifically um, looking at like how a hiring manager would um, react to that. Um, as someone who hires a bunch of people, I can tell you I do not discount internship experience in any way, shape, or form. If you um, had a valuable experience and can articulate, um, you know, um, at a high level, um, what what you learn, what projects you're engaged in, the rationale for those projects, um, you know, specific techniques that you're involved with, the ability to troubleshoot, um, that's what matters, right? Experience is experience. Um, um, and, um, you know, it's, it's how you kind of communicate that at the end of the day um, in an interview or on your resume that I think is impactful. Um, so I would not discount, quote unquote, internship experience in any way, shape or form. And I absolutely do not when I am making hiring decisions um, for the group um, here in the core. And I, we were talking about this as a panel earlier, and maybe um, other people can riff on this a little bit too. Um, um, it, for those of you who are graduating from a certain program or going into a certain program, you're over a decade into one of the most successful training programs that the state of California has seen, right? Um, the the um, partners that these programs have that um, ultimately host and hire these students know the high quality and kind of amazing effort and impact that um, these students can contribute um, to organizations. And um, um, you're going into a job market that is looking for talented people to do things at high levels and have come from a program that prepares you to do that. And so um, um, just being associated with CERN Bridges gives you a leg up in many ways. And I would not worry about that internship. Carl, since you're managing a team as well and hire, do you want to add um, anything to that? I mean, I'll, I'll agree with you, Ken, that really, you know, relevant experience is more important than when it happened, you know, just because it happens before you graduate or something like that, it doesn't mean that it counts any less. Um, I think the fact that what you're doing in so many cases is very, very relevant to, you know, the potential positions you're applying to, you know, counts possibly, you know, more than other types of experience might, um, even if they occur afterwards. So I completely agree. I think it's extremely valuable and wouldn't be something that um, I or anyone else that I'm familiar with would write off in, in any way. So I, I yeah. agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was one thing that I missed here that I think was relevant to our previous discussion. It was specifically addressed to Carl. So I guess we'll start with you, Carl, but I think anyone could address it. Is when we were talking about challenges and we talked about making that jump to independence, were there any discrete concrete tips for making that jump um, to independence? Sure. I mean, I think that it, in a way, it may not be something that's done in, in it's, it's definitely done in baby steps, but at the same time, you just have to, there's some, there's some point where you're going to have to say, I'm going to evaluate the situation, make a decision and go with what I decide instead of 
um, you know, worrying about checking every aspect of it. And I think that that is a process and it takes time, but ultimately there has to be a moment or a time when, you know, you're, you make the conscious decision to say, I'm going to make, you know, this other decision. So it's kind of deciding to decide or deciding to give yourself that, that space to, to do it. And I mean, I think it's important to work with mentors or, or managers or whatever it is too, and kind of um, have them help you build up to that point. If they know that's a goal for you, then they can, you know, intentionally sort of put you in situations that are going to force you into that a little more and that kind of thing. So I guess not to completely go off the rails, but I do think that's another um, really important thing to, to mention is that your internship is yours and you can't rely on anybody else to, to make it exactly what you want it to be. So while your mentor um, is going to be a really important part of that, you know, you, you need to be the one in the driver's seat saying, you know, this is what I want to get out of it. And if autonomy and independence is one of the things that's really important that you get out of it, which I think it should be, then you need to, you know, make sure you're taking steps to get there. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't get help with it, but, you know, you really need to, to take control and, and, you know, be proactive about those types of things. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, your mentors signed up to this to be a mentor and they don't know how to mentor you if you don't tell them, right? Um, and so having that open communication, that open dialogue is incredibly helpful um, and can even, you know, start to kind of help define how you make that move to independence and then also whether or not, you know, your postdoc or PI or mentor is ready for you to do that, right? Um, and so they would obviously be engaged in that discussion at some point too. Um, so having that open communication channel um, is, is uber important. I find that some of our most successful interns are um, very good at that. Um, um, uh, kind of defining kind of, you know, kind of what they hope and want, um, and also making sure they know what the mentor hopes and wants too, um, as well. Um, it seems to be an ongoing theme for our successful students. Um, cool. Sarah, Ankit, anything that you guys wanted to add or kind of just um, same points um, um, there? Um, how do you make that jump to independence? I think pretty much just the same points, but I really liked how Carl said that um, you really have to, you get to the point where I think you kind of trust yourself or like you just have to believe in yourself and kind of make that that step of the transition. Um, but yeah, the, the mentorship too is important to help you get to that point. Yeah. Awesome. Ankit, anything there from you? Yeah, just to really emphasize what you said is like, you need to really come with the mindset that you want to become independent. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen by accident. I think that was one of the biggest things for me personally. I wanted to be independent and I knew there was, it was going to take some time. So I took baby steps, as Carl mentioned, to get there. Um, and that's, that's the way, uh, you gain the independence and the trust also the mentors and the PI. Um, even if you make a mistake, I think just owning up to it and providing solutions that, that would maybe solve that or troubleshooting your experiments. I think that's a, shows leadership qualities and also taking, being accountable for your actions is, is a big part. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that point too, Ankit, about, um, you know, mistakes happen and everyone understands that, but the best thing you can do when that happens or just in general is, you know, think about it and see if there's any solutions you can think of it. You know, if you only come to people with problems, you know, that's not going to get you as far as coming with a problem and a potential solution, even if that doesn't end up being the solution that gets chosen or you go with just kind of showing that you're, you're thinking about it in that way, I think is really powerful and also gets you to think, you know, in the, in the, the right way so that you can come up with better solutions in the future too. You know, being a problem solver it is important in every aspect of, you know, work and life and all that. So I think that's that's really important. So I really like that. I agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is another question that I think dovetails into this a little bit, especially when I think about my experience. And it was, what would you tell your past self, you know, before they went into the program, knowing what you know today? And one of the first things I would tell myself is, you know, own, own the stuff that you screwed up on um, and be honest and candid with that. Not that I wasn't. I, I always was really timid about it, though. Um, and um, um, the um, other, other thing um, is, again, what we're talking about throughout here is you really have to be your own advocate during your internship program um, and be, you know, you know, um, uh, you know, actively engaged with communication channels, with forming a network, with, um, you know, kind of creating those opportunities to be involved in other things, right? And in and outside of direct projects you might be working on. Um, and that, you know, kind of um, extracurricular stuff in many ways really colors the 
overall, you know, um, experience um, in many ways and makes it more enriching. Um, and so I would, I would add that there. Um, going, going along those lines, maybe Sarah, what, what, um, what was, um, what would be something that you would have um, told your past self if you could do it all again today? Yeah, I, yeah, I have something in mind. Um, I think that I would tell myself that not every lab situation or job situation is a good match for you, and that's okay. Like you kind of have to feel these things out, and it's not necessarily um, like a failure on your part if if it doesn't work out that way. You might find that you know it's it's more of a learning experience. I think learning about yourself and what you're really interested in, and I think when you find you go through that little journey and you find out those things about yourself. I think that um, that kind of makes a really good um, job situation or yeah. you know life situation for you later on. Absolutely, and I also feel like getting back to that question we engaged with earlier that when you find that interest, that is probably also something that's driving independence, right? Like if you are excited and engaged, that gives you the confidence to make that step in many ways too. Yeah, I'm, I love that thought, Sarah. Um, yeah, I love that thought. Um, Ankit, how about you? What What is some advice you would have given your past self? Um, I think not to be afraid to jump in and think differently when thinking about experiments or just about situations that arise in research. Um, like you mentioned, I was pretty timid to, to maybe suggest something otherwise if a mentor was uh, going in a specific direction. Um, God was a member of line of communication and science is always evolving and there's always new ways to look at a problem and that your opinion matters as much as theirs, even though it might not be the most well-informed in, in the room. Um, I think just saying, talking about and discussing about science is the way you, as a good way to grow as a young scientist. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, let's, let's hit some more questions here. You, um, um, audience, you guys are keeping us busy. There's so much here and I'm, I'm sorry if we don't get to yours, they're all great. Um, um, and um, um, I, hopefully we get to uh, more of these, um, but um, apologies if we don't get to yours. There's a lot of really fantastic questions in here. Um, ah, here's a good one. Okay, so in thinking about um, what you all have decided to do post your sermon education, so you have you know Carl and I that went into kind of um, an academic professional career for me, Carl, obviously on the industry side, and then Ankit and Sarah going into graduate programs. Um, Sarah for a PhD, Ankit for MD, PhD. Um, you know, um, what factors helped you in nudging you towards those um, ultimate career paths? Um, um, I, I'll just take that one right off the bat um, and be really honest that this was not my ultimate career path when I came out of the Bridges program. Um, I was dead set on going to a PhD program, and the first thing I, the first conversation I had with the hiring manager that hired me um, was that you have me for probably two years. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. Um, you know, um, my ultimate goal is to go to a PhD um, after this, um, and I, I never left. I had a lot of opportunities for career advancement, and I stayed at Salk and did a lot of exciting things, and now I'm the director of the facility um, and still work with that same person who hired me a decade ago. Um, um, uh, and so um, uh, I, there was some serendipity there that was not planned. Um, um, and I think Sarah kind of mentioned this earlier about keeping your options open and um, you know, um, using um, you know, your interests, um, using the internship as a um, uh, tool to kind of hone your interests, right? In many ways. Um, and I, I realized, you know, um, not through the internship, but through experiences after the internship that, you know, I was really having a really engaging career without getting a PhD and having a, um, a lot of opportunity for advancement um, and development um, um, just, just through the Bridges experience um, itself. Um, um, so, yeah. Um, um, and maybe, Carl, for you, what, what factors help you decide on your career path? Because you've had kind of a um, um, trajectory, you know, as a tech in ind or in, in academia and academic lab and then into industry there, what, what drove your trajectory there? Yeah, I think for me, um, industry was always something that uh, interested me. I didn't have plans to, to go on to further education after my master's. Um, long term, I knew that I at least wanted to try it out and, and see if that was something that I wanted to pursue further. And once I got here, I found out it was a, a pretty good fit. And I think I think it's really about finding out, you know, um, 
one of it is what motivates you and, and then what, you know, working situation, what kind of structures um, do you work best in? For me, I like having the kind of overarching structure of product development as a, you know, kind of a stabilizing point in, in terms of how we think about what we're, we're going to do in the lab. So, you know, in academia, it can be very different in terms of, um, you know, where, how you choose that focus. Whereas, um, you know, obviously in industry, we're focused on making a, a quality product for a certain type of customer and making sure that, that we deliver what they need. So I, for me personally, and like I said, I think that's just a, a personal thing that that type of focus is really what appeals to me. Um, and I think you can, you know, do really well, whatever that is, but helping to determine what that is for you and, and what sort of motivates you and, and what keeps you, you know, focused is, is a big part of that. Awesome. Yeah. So just a few more minutes here. So I think we'll continue on this um, theme. Um, Sarah, um, you know, with your kind of also um, wavy background, um, you know, biotech, um, back to grad school, um, um, internship, back into grad school, um, how did you feel that the, your internship experience, your Stormbridge experience solidified that interest um, in doing higher ed for you? Um, yeah, I think um, there was so much great mentorship in the program that kind of helped me um, lead to my decision of continuing in academia and, and getting a PhD. Um, you know, seeing people um, design experiments and projects, um, I realized that was something that I wanted to do also um, and collaborate with other researchers and have that kind of creativity that you can have uh, to make different projects and things happen. Um, I think that's what kind of drew me to staying in academia for a bit longer and doing my PhD. Yeah, awesome, yeah. Ankit, um, how about you? Um, same question. Yeah, I had a mentor who was an MD PhD student at the time. Um, and I saw how valuable having a PhD was in addressing some of the problems that we were look, um, looking at at Stanford. Um, the, his uh, approach of addressing difficult clinical problems was, was for me, it was a, honestly, it was very motivating and uh, something where I wanted to coexist in. And I thought I could do that with a medical degree, which I still believe you know, MDs can't, but to go to that different, uh, getting that different perspective, I think the PhD was uh, needed for me personally. And I wanted to coexist in, in those two disciplines and to be a physician scientist, I think uh, personally I needed the, the PhD training. Awesome, yeah. All right, so um, we'll take one last question here um, and I'm kind of picking one that's a little bit uh, more um, post internship focused. Um, and it is, um, do you feel that your opportunities and plans came easily after the program was over? Did people reach out to you or was it easy to get, um, or, or, and was it easy to get um, responses um, from others? Um, um, so I, I think this is really, you know, you know, after, if I could sum up the question in a nutshell, um, after you've had this amazing experience, how do you leverage this for the next thing? Um, um, and um, I think, again, you have to be your own advocate here um, and, you know, make sure that you're taking the, um, you know, opportunity to kind of digest your experience and communicate that in a way, either on a resume, LinkedIn, you know, um, various platforms there that is impactful, engaging to the audience that is receiving it, right? Um, um, for those of you who are on LinkedIn, don't be shy about splashing certain bridges all over your LinkedIn profile. Um, and you'll see a lot of people that um, have gone through that too that are on there as well. Um, 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 how about um, others of you, maybe Ankit, um, back to you. Um, you know, how, how did you find the next opportunity and, and you know, um, how easy was it for you to kind of do that next step? Maybe some connectivity issues there. Um, Carl or Sarah, you, either you wanna take that one on? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, I, I, at least for me, I think that um, it's it's kind of back to the old phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I, I don't mean to say that, um, you know, you should spend all your time uh, schmoozing or anything like that. But honestly, the, the connections you make in your internship, I think you'll find to be extremely valuable going forward. You know, every position I've moved on to since that time has been in some way facilitated by the relationships that I formed during that internship. Which, which is pretty incredible. 
Um, and I think too, it, you know, I, I'm not an extremely outgoing person. You don't have to be a, a big socialite or anything like that to, to get a lot of value. It's just about, you know, being interested in what other people are working on, talking to them uh, about what they're doing, um, you know, maybe grabbing lunch, a coffee, going out of your way to just kind of get to know what's going on in the lab, getting to know other people. Um, and then when the time comes, not being, you know, afraid to just check in. You don't have to say, hey, can you give me a job? But you can just ask, hey, is, are there any positions open in, in this area or, or anything like that? Or, or just maintain those relationships in general. And I think if you do both those things, then um, hopefully at the right time, things will come to you um, naturally. But also, you know, like Ken said, you'll be kind of um, leveraging, you know, what, what you've gained through the uh, internship to, to hopefully get the, the opportunities you want when you want them. But um, I think if you're, you're patient and you leverage both those things, you'll things will come your way. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, Carl, I really love that point. And one thing um, that is so true about every academic lab is the vast majority of people you are working with in that academic lab are going to be leaving it at some point for the next thing, right? And just knowing them and staying engaged with them, you know, that's an immediate opportunity at whatever their next thing is potentially, right? Um, so it really opens up a lot of doors just by embracing, you know, that kind of network and the personalities around you. Um, you know, at all levels, um, you know, because, you know, no one, um, you know, stays in a single academic lab forever, except for the PI, <laughs> um, uh, for the most part, right? And so a lot of these people are moving around a lot. Um, and it's um, uh, just an amazing opportunity to build a network that can really work for you in a big way. Um, Sarah and Ankit, any last thoughts um, before we wrap up here? Yes, yeah, sure. As uh, Carl was saying, just piggyback off of him. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you have to put yourself out there and you don't have to talk to a lot of people or go out of your way, so to speak, and go to these like schmooze, but just being in the CERM program and now established for about 10 years, having those connections really helps out to just get started. And as you meet other people and gain other opportunities, you're able to just grow your network. Um, but having the internship on, on your resume or even just going through the experience um, is very helpful because you have a good idea of what to expect in the research um, field, or if you want to go pursue a medical degree or a PhD or MD, PhD, really opens your eyes. You're interacting with um, multiple different types of uh, individuals that have different career paths, and you get an idea of where you may fit in or whether it's not for you completely. So I think that is very valuable um, because you know what you know is just part of what you don't know, in my opinion. Just what you don't like, actually. So I think just. Um, for me, it really helped me decide on my career path. So I really suggest to other, other individuals that are considering this program. Sarah, final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think uh, you can highlight a lot of experiences on your resume that you, you get from this program. Like make sure you highlight all those conferences that you spoke at or any you know publications, obviously, that you got during the internship. I think all of those things um, um, you know, make you a great candidate later on. It's, um, yeah. Awesome, yeah. Well, um, thank you all to the panelists and Kit, Carl, Sarah. It was fantastic having you here. Thank you all um, in the audience for um, having so many fantastic and engaging questions. And again, sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Um, there was a lot to um, cover in the, in the scroll down list there. Um, and thanks to the organizers for allowing us to be here. Um, you know, um, I think all of us have had really unique and beneficial experiences through CIRM. And, um, um, you know, uh, it has really defined our careers and um, academic opportunities, you know, after that in many ways, shapes and forms. And, it, um, you know, for those of you graduating um, from CIRM programs in the near future, congratulations. Um, best of luck on what's next for you is entering, for those entering CIRM programs, make the most of it, um, be your own advocate um, and um, um, get that network growing and working for you. Um, I think with that, we'll turn it back over um, um, to Kelly um, and Jonathan here. Thank you so much. Kelly, I think you're muted. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> we have a few minutes before we are technically scheduled to begin our wrap up. Um, if uh, people would like to take a five or 10 minute break, we could do that. Um, otherwise, if, uh, if, if not, I'd be willing to try to address any questions that you might have about other aspects of career development. Obviously I wasn't a Bridges alumni myself, 
but I have interactions with many Bridges alumni over the years and also my fellow CIRM colleagues have come from industry um, and come from a variety of different positions. And so um, I can take a stab at any other types of questions if you're interested while we're waiting. So here's a question. Do you have any advice for interns that are undecided about what specific field of research they want to pursue after the internship? That's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of people might not know exactly what they wanna do because there are so many different opportunities. And I think some of the advice I might offer for that is to be open-minded. It's You might find that when you go and look for jobs, especially in industry, you'll find that a lot of positions are advertising for very specific skills that might be a not a perfect match for you. And you shouldn't necessarily be afraid to apply for that, even if it's not, if you're sure you're not a perfect fit, because a lot of the skills you learn during your internship, critical thinking, troubleshooting, these sorts of skills can be applied in any situation. And sometimes it's a matter of your fit with the company. Um, also, you will find when you go and uh, work in the industry that there are a lot of different types of ways that your research skills can be applied that you don't necessarily learn about in the academic setting. I know some of you are experiencing this who are doing internships in biotech companies or, or uh, pharma where there's this whole area of science called process engineering and process development where you figure out how a process that you developed in the research lab can be converted into one that can be scaled up. Uh, manufacturing processes. This is an area of huge need, and it's just starting to really take off in the gene and cell therapy fields. And I think there's going to be a lot of growing demand for that. And sometimes the only way you can get experience in that is starting off with your traditional research approach, going into industry and getting your foot in that door and building up your skills in that area. So I think, you know, being open minded about possibilities, if you're really married to a very specific uh, set, you know, project and a very specific path, it might take you a while to find a job that will do that. But if you're open-minded and willing to try different things, you might find that, that there's new paths forward for you. Um, look, at, um, look at me, I'm a program officer. Um, I was trained as a scientist, but I am a program officer. I don't think I knew what a program officer was when I got my PhD. <laughs> But um, actually, it's a very interesting position. There are a lot of program officers who work at funding agencies like the NIH and at CIRM. And we help, we need to understand the field as a whole and understand where the needs are and come up with ways to um, invest in the science that is needed to move those fields forward. You get exposure at a different level, kind of at a higher level to a lot of different areas, or you can go and get in the weeds to the extent that you want. And it's, there's just, there's a lot of possibilities that are open to you with the research background. And so I would, I would just encourage you to take chances and explore things. Um, the more you learn about yourself, the more happy you'll be when you um, find that career for yourself. Are there any other questions that didn't get addressed that I might be able to answer? Kelly, I'm out of question. Is there a way to leave my contact information? So if anybody in the audience maybe wants to reach out, um, they could reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help out any certain interns that may be looking good to medical school or MD, PhD. Uh, yes. Um, if you would like, you could put it into the chat. But if if that's not, uh, okay, people have already left, you can send your information to me and I'll compile it and I will make it available to the program directors who organize the meeting and maybe they, they have the distribution list from the registrants and could send it out or or somebody or they would be able to contact. Yeah, that works. I could email you then. Okay, that sounds yeah. good. Thank you. All right. How about a Maybe with just a few minutes left, I wonder if some of you could speak to the value of mentorship in your experience. I know we have the uh, professor in the lab who helps you with your research, but more often than not, you're probably working on the day-to-day -day basis with a postdoc or a graduate student. Were there any people who are particularly influential in helping you maintain focus and, and your positive attitude? And 
or perhaps gave you career advice? And uh, what were the types of things that they were able to offer you that were most helpful? Sarah, you wanna jump in on that and I'll follow up? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's so many mentors, I think, beyond the PI in the lab. Um, there's different lab sizes. I, lucky I was in a large lab, so I had lots of opportunities to, to make connections and things, but I did work primarily with a postdoc in the lab who was, um, um, you know, a great mentor. Um, and I worked very closely on projects with him. Um, yeah, he, you know, he guided me through gaining the technical kind of skills that I needed to do the research and, um, and yeah, really was encouraging and um, provided guidance and then kind of provided, uh, gave me, you know, some independence and things. So I was able to kind of develop my independence. Um, but even beyond my own lab, um, my I had an excellent home mentor too at San Diego State. Dr. Ralph Foyer was an awesome mentor and he kind of connected me to the program. Um, he kind of recognized that it might be a good fit for me. And I'm super grateful for that. Um, so there's just so many opportunities, I think, along your path to, to make these connections. Yeah, awesome. I mean, um, uh, labs are big, diverse places. Institutes are big, diverse places. And uh, there's always um, a lot of opportunities for mentorship all around you. Um, I, I'll, I'll add one thought to that. And uh, we um, typically don't host interns directly through the core, but pretty much every CERM intern that comes through the Salk Institute works with myself and my staff in some way, some way shape, or form. And provide we provide you know the kind of that more informal soft mentorship to those students and really engage with them in a big way, um, and we we find that incredibly um, valuable, impactful, and meaningful to us. Um, um, and um, um, so I think there's a lot of those opportunities like that outside of your immediate lab. There's other other networks inside your institute that are meant to enable research at your institute that you can kind of use as um, areas of mentorship as well. Um, 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 so something to think about there, especially if, if you have stem cell core facilities at the institute you're going with. Those are a lot of experts doing a lot of things at a high level and a lot of diversity of um, types of projects they're engaged in. Um, and so they're really good people to know and be engaged with. And um, Carl might attest to you, they can help you find some decent jobs too um, down the road. Um, uh, so, um, um, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, actually, I mean, that was my exact experience. I mean, not only from a mentorship standpoint, but, you know, getting a job afterward, but I mean, and uh, honestly, you know, Ken and I kind of started uh, a relationship just as a friendship, you know, in doing cell culture in hoods right next to each other. Um, and for me, that really turned into a great, you know, uh, mentorship. And I've, I've learned a lot from a number of the years. And, you know, we still clearly from, from this panel still interact a lot and, and get a lot out of uh, our professional relationship too, which is, which is pretty cool. And I think you'll find a lot of similar situations if you are open to them. Well, everyone, JT is back. JT, we have just a few minutes left. Are, do you want to go through your slides or do you want to give us a, a quick uh, send off message before I close things out? I'm sorry we lost you earlier. Unmute. I think you're still muted, JT. How's that? Can hear you. There we go. Uh, well, in, 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 in listening to the last panel about uh, challenges to overcome, I'd certainly like to add uh, staying on the internet when you have a speech coming up to hundreds of people, which of course Murphy's Law always applies on these things. So I apologize for being late here. Kelly, how much time do we have? <laughs> One minute, technically. <laughs> One minute. Okay. Well, so I think the slides will go by the wayside. Uh, I think just so everybody knows, uh, had some slides for for all of you on uh, the new and improved version of CERM, courtesy of the language in Prop 14. And perhaps Kelly, you could uh, make that available online to everybody. The slide deck. It's pretty self-explanatory uh, and tells you about how uh, just e exactly what a major triumph for patients it was to have Prop 14 passed uh, last November. Uh, but just a, a few comments since we don't have a lot of time here. Uh, 
as Kelly knows, uh, the Bridges program is one of my personal favorites and, and the favorite of a number of our board members because uh, all of you guys uh, do such exciting and exceptional work. I know that it was the comment that uh, it's not who you know uh, or not uh, what you know, but who you know. I'd like to add a corollary to that, which is you make your own luck, uh, which is to say that uh, because uh, each of you are stars, uh, you've positioned yourself through getting into this CERM program to go on and do magnificent work, whether it's in academia or industry or both. Uh, and uh, we are so privileged to be able to provide this program to you uh, at a time when uh, obviously the pace of science has accelerated dramatically uh, the, the opportunities in the regenerative medicine space are, uh, are multiplying by the day. Uh, there uh, are, uh, there's such a wealth of talent in California, the, the a chance to go in and either study with the, the best and the brightest or to go into industry and to do things that will dramatically contribute to the future of medicine uh, are, are just, uh, so profound and and we are uh, as a board uh, we emphasize the the educational part of what we enable uh, a great deal uh, and a, a, just a shout out to Kelly for the fantastic job she does running this program it's not an easy thing to do uh, in person certainly even more of a challenge virtually uh, so Kelly thank you for everything you do to make this happen Thank you to all the, the heads of the programs at all the various Bridges sites, uh, the enthusiasm and leadership that you bring to this, make it all happen for all of the students. And to the students, uh, you guys are the best. You really are. We're so proud of you and know that you're going to go on from here and do fantastic work uh, and make us all proud and make yourselves proud. So. Uh, I had planned to give you about 15 minutes, but the internet doesn't permit. So I think I'm just going to close by saying on behalf of the CERM board, uh, just go out there and, and continue what you're doing. And we will really look forward to hearing from you in future years as to the many successes you all have and the great contributions you make. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, and and everybody please uh, stay safe and go out and keep doing what you're doing. You're doing just fantastic work. I echo all of JT's thank yous and especially to you as well, Greg, for helping us with all the IT support and the meeting organizers. You should all be receiving a survey after the meeting. If you could just please take a few minutes to tell us uh, what you liked and didn't like about this. Hopefully it won't be virtual again next year, but we do appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your summer. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.